welcome back to a video lecture concerning the basic principles and concepts underlying spatial land use planning. I am your teacher Kaisa and in the second part of my lecture I will introduce you the process of conservation planning and principles of spatial conservation prioritization. In addition we will make an imaginary trip to mountain ranges where rare species are under threat and in need of conservation. We will also chew on the impacts of habitat amount, quality and aggregation on populations and species communities. And finally, I will explain the principles of the theory of island biogeography and how it relates to spatial conservation planning. In the last part of this lecture, we had an adventure within landscape ecology and conservation biology. Now we enter the sphere of applied sciences. And in the earlier part, I encouraged you to be very specific on the scientific terminology. And while keeping that in mind, I now urge you to think openly about conservation prioritization. Try to detect its opportunities. Spatial conservation prioritization lies at the nexus of land use planning, conservation planning and natural resource management. Let's go through a few key terms that pop up again and again throughout our course. First important term is conservation assessment. It means detection of conservation opportunities and priorities. Then we have spatial conservation prioritization. It refers to the process of using spatial analysis of quantitative data to identify locations for conservation investment. Conservation planning in turn means combining conservation assessment with spatial prioritization and the implementation of this planning process. We also talk about conservation resource allocation and it answers to the question, what is the best balanced way to allocate a given budget and or conservation effort. Then conservation decision analysis is a method to answer the question, what is the best optimal alternative among many implementation possibilities. Conservation decision analysis can for example, include comparison of different kinds of uh, conservation scenarios against each other. I like to show this figure, although it is a bit old. However, its contents are not outdated at all. This is the operational model for spatial conservation planning by Knight and colleagues. It shows that the planning process is not straightforward at all. It includes many stages that interact and feed back to previous stages of the planning process. Many of the arrows drawn here actually take place in conversations among various stakeholders. For example, it is important to discuss how the present landscape is built on the past land uses and what the future designed landscape should look like. The actual spatial prioritization or targeting conservation action to specific locations is just one analytical part of the cyclical process of conservation planning. Spatial prioritization is a key step that connects the assessment and planning activities and lays ground to conservation management. An alternative way to conceptualize conservation planning is through its methods. Spatial prioritization is basically one analytical tool for selecting locations with high conservation value. There are also other alternatives that do not build on the spatial information as strongly. However, it is the usage of spatial data that makes spatial prioritization a strong tool for conservation planning. The prioritization analysis can be built on various methods, so Nason falls into the category of complementarity-based methods. 
and we will dig deeper into these analytical options later during the course. Okay, so spatial conservation prioritization identifies spatial allocation of conservation resources or conservation action. Uh, these actions can include protection, meaning reduction of loss in terms of what we wish to conserve. Maintenance, to maintain favorable conditions, typically for biodiversity. Management, to achieve desired conditions. Or restoration action, to return closer to past, more favorable conditions or succession trajectory. Also, offsetting can be planned. Offsetting means actions to compensate for negative biodiversity impacts. Spatial conservation prioritization also identifies spatial allocation of other forms of land use, if that is desirable. But this kind of resource allocation between several alternative actions or land uses is not straightforward. And spatial conservation prioritization uses different kinds of biodiversity features as data. What are these biodiversity features? So in practice, they are the data layers that we feed into the analysis. The spatial data used in prioritization analysis is in zonation language called biodiversity feature data. All these data have some meaning with regards to the land use planning problem at hand. So biodiversity features under consideration are derived from conservation goals. They can be species and habitats that are often used as biodiversity units in conservation, but also communities, processes or ecosystem services can be considered as well if we have data on those. Biodiversity features are analyzed according to the model of conservation value, which are those sites that are given the highest priority. Criteria here can be based on occurrence and co-occurrence of features, or rarity of features, or weights. Not all features always receive the same value in the analysis. Also, the richness of biodiversity features on a given location can be prioritized. For example, if we want to emphasize species richness or number of species. Because biodiversity is all about variation, it is very logical to emphasize richness in spatial prioritization. All this information is squeezed into one model of conservation value that the zonation analysis uses. We will get back to the details of modeling conservation value later on. There are 10 basic principles of spatial conservation prioritization. Let's go through of them all. First, we have a comprehensiveness. It means sampling the full range of biodiversity, taking into account ecological composition, structure and function. It is important to remember or note that a fully comprehensive network of priority areas is technically impossible, but we can try to achieve as much of comprehensiveness as possible. Then we have surrogacy. It means that perfect information of biodiversity is not feasible. We can't know everything. Indicators can be used to derive indirect information on other features. This is very common in, in prioritization analysis. Then representativeness. Representativeness means that all biodiversity features receive some level of conservation investment. And complementarity, and this was the important word in relation to zonation. So zonation is a complementarity based um, prioritization tool. Complementarity means uh, the extent that different sites in a reserve network complement each other to achieve conservation goals. It takes multiple sites into account at the same time. Then we have adequacy and persistence. They 
refer to a network of priority sites that should sustain all features contained within the long term. This principle is not yet well developed in spatial prioritization because it is a bit hard to tackle. Remember this figure from the last part? When we speak about rare and threatened species, it is crucial to know how much habitat or other resources the species needs to survive. If the species is prone to fragmentation effects, its conservation needs to be planned so that there is enough habitat available in patches that are not isolated from each other. This so-called how much protection is enough question is studied both theoretically and empirically. The practical challenge in conservation studies is that the more rare and the more threatened a focal species or habitat is, the more difficult it is to study its requirements experimentally. And we really can't risk, risk the persistence of a threatened species by underestimating its extinction threshold in relation to the needed amount of habitat. We have to safeguard the most threatened species. Okay, back to the principles. The sixth principle of conservation prioritization is cost efficiency. It means that we need a network of priority sites that is comprehensive, representative and or adequate for least possible cost. And these costs can be measured in different terms. We can speak about direct costs, for example, land acquisition in terms of money, uh, the monetary costs of management actions. We can also measure transaction costs, for example, identifying a negotiation with landowners. This is typically time people use for underlaying the conservation solution into practice. Then we can include opportunity costs. They are losses due to lost opportunity, for example, in terms of land uses. And cost efficiency is calculated as return on investment, so sum of benefits divided by sum of costs. Cost efficiency is something that is typically very important when thinking about implementation of conservation solutions and conservation plans. Then we have a threat and vulnerability. This principle means information on threatening processes and the vulnerability of locations and biodiversity features to these processes. These need to be taken into account. Threat and vulnerability affect formulation of conservation targets, design of networks and schedule implementation of conservation planning. Flexibility refers to alternative network solutions that are based on non-unique occurrences of biodiversity features across the analyzed landscape. Flexibility means that not all high priority not all high priority areas can be protected. And flexibility is related to emerging opportunities or lost opportunities. Then back to costs. We have a different type of cost that is called replacement cost. It means the economic or biological cost following either a forced inclusion or exclusion of a location. So if we know that some site needs to be protected or conserved, or we know that some site cannot be conserved, these sites can't be included in the final solution. And this means that there are constraints to that solution. And replacement cost can be calculated as a different between optimal cost-efficient unconstrained solution and optimal solution with forcing. So if we had all possibilities open, what would the end result be like? Or if we take these practical constraints into account, what will the end result be? 
be like the difference between those, these two things. Then finally, we have the principle of irreplaceability. It means that certain locations can be essential for optimal solution. All right. We have this example of nestedness in biodiversity from the course on conservation biology here in, in our university. And let's think about these key principles and especially this last one, irreplaceability, in more detail using this example as, as our tool. So imagine that we have three mountain ranges with three mountains in each. And species that inhabit the mountains are marked with letters. And we can calculate the diversity of species either on mountain or on a mountain range level. These are respective to local and landscape level diversities and are denoted with alpha and gamma. So here we have the alpha diversity value, uh, average species count per mountain, and here we have the gamma diversity value, how many species there are on one mountain range. So the alpha diversity is average over its mountain ranges. There are slight differences in the number of species per mountain in the ranges. But gamma is just the sum over the range. And then we can also calculate the beta diversity by dividing gamma with alpha. So which locations should we choose if we were to protect one mountain range or if we were to protect one mountain, or if we were to protect two mountains from one range in order to maximize the number of protected species. Now we want to emphasize richness. Species richness is our goal here. Okay, let's stop here for a moment. Let's think a bit. We have certain information. How can we use that in order to make these conservation decisions? All right. So, Mountain range two has the highest total species richness. That would then be the range to be protected in terms of comprehensiveness, representativeness and cost efficiency. Then the third mountain in range one has the highest number of species. That would be the one mountain to be protected. In the third case, the combined number of species into alternative mountain pairs in range two is the same. So we could choose either one of the mountain pairs. This is in line with the principles of flexibility and complementarity. Okay, but about the identities of the species, <laughs> shouldn't we like not take rarity into account? Now we have a different kind of objective. We want to protect the rarest species. First, let's see where the species occur by inspecting a presence absence matrix, where the species are listed as columns and mountains as rows, with a Roman numeral referring to each mountain as a row name. Zero means that that species that does not occur on that mountain, and one means that this particular species does occur on that mountain. The rarest species are J, I, H, G, and A. Based on the information, we can define reasonable conservation targets for each of the rarest species. For species A and G, it could be enough to protect three out of four existing populations. For the rarer species H, I and J, we wish to protect all remaining populations. Okay, now we can already see that those mountains that do not have rare species can be forsaken from this conservation solution. 
The second mountain does not have any of the species we wish to protect, so that can be excluded. The same is true for the mountain number eight. Now we are left only with mountains that have some value in terms of our conservation objective. Here we come to the principle of irreplaceability. Irreplaceable mountains need to be included in the solution so that we can meet our aim on species protection. We have to protect the sixth and the ninth mountain in order to meet the protection needs for species H, I and J. These mountains are irreplaceable for our conservation solution. They are shown with purple color here. In addition, we should include the third mountain as it has both species A and G and thus complements the selection cost efficiently. That mountain is shown with blue color. Then we need to protect two mountains that have species A, but they can be chosen among the first, fourth and seventh mountain. We thus have some flexibility in choosing the final protection sites. So these are the green mountains. In terms of representativeness, let's, let's choose the first mountain as it has the highest species richness. The fourth and the seventh mountains are non-unique, meaning that either one can be chosen. So let's choose the seventh mountain and forsake the fourth mountain. Then, hey, actually we could sacrifice the third mountain and replace it with the fifth mountain that has species G but lacks species A. However, then in Again, in terms of representativeness, the third mountain has higher conservation value. So let's keep that in our final solution. We can remove now the fifth mountain. Now we have the final solution of five protected mountains that fulfills our conservation objective, following the principles of spatial conservation prioritization. Well, this example reduces the spatial aspect into a rough categorization, as location was included only as a qualitative character here. However, the example shows how the principles of prioritization work on the biodiversity attributes allocated to specific locations. Well, what happens? If we include the spatial aspect for real, we still have data on species or habitats or other so-called biodiversity features that occur on a known location. But now more emphasis in given on spatial patterns, spatial configuration and spatial units become more important. Also scale is of importance. The questions we ask and the solutions we get from any spatial analysis are scale dependent. Land use as a phenomenon ranges from sites to landscapes and it is planned from local to regional level with a strong emphasis on landscape level. It is a completely different thing to plan land use for a small local site sized a few hectares when compared to a hundreds of kilometers sized region that encompasses a variety of different habitats and forms a landscape in itself. In addition to size and scale, spatial location has a strong effect on the criteria upon which conservation planning is done. The biodiversity features are largely different in southern Finland when compared to northern Lapland. While taking spatial scale, spatial units and conservation targets into account, spatial conservation planning often deals with questions relating to habitat area, quality and aggregates. These form the three fundamental axes of spatial ecology. Let's start with aggregates. Habitat arrangement has multiple dimensions. Here, aggregation refers to how habitat is concentrated in space without taking habitat amount 
or quality into account. Habitat aggregation is a configurational measure that is the same for all species within the landscape. Aggregation is often confused with connectivity. Connectivity is a functional measure that builds both on aggregation and habitat amount. We will get back to the concept of connectivity in a later lecture. Now let's concentrate on aggregation and aggregation as a structural measure of spatial concentration of a habitat within the landscape. In addition to aggregation, quality and area are of importance in spatial ecology. Habitat quality is defined as a measure of potential population growth and or population density. Generally, habitat quality is a factor that depends on the availability of resources. Area is the total coverage with a positive quality. That is the available amount of habitat that can sustain a species. Okay, let's focus on one species at a time. Forget community ecology for a moment. Area quality and aggregation have independent effects on population sizes. In the figure panels B, C and D, solid lines give potential carrying capacity for a population and dashed lines give long-term expected population size. Remember that area means here the total coverage of habitat with positive quality. In panel B, population size increases with area. In panel C, the overall quality of the landscape improves and the population size grows accordingly. Note that the quality of habitat can vary between patches. Here the, difference, here the effect is averaged over all patches. In panel D, we see what is in effect inverse fragmentation, like this. Here, the potential of the landscape to sustain a population is kept constant and the expected population size reaches the level of carrying capacity at a certain level of aggregation. So out of the three, which are the most important factors in ecological sense? Total carrying capacity or maximum population size steadily increases with increasing habitat area or amount. The same is true for habitat quality, but not for aggregation. These kinds of similar general relationships are observed for different species and their habitats. So it seems that aggregation is not as important as area or quality. Area and quality determine the, lo the local carrying capacity of a site and aggregation affects local dynamics. We already know that the probability of local extinction is related to population size, which often is approximated by habitat area or amount. We also know that the probability of colonization of a habitat patch is determined by its connectedness to existing populations. The late ecologist Ilka Hanski did groundbreaking work in studying the metapopulations of the butterfly Melitea xinxia in the Orland Islands. He and his team figured out the importance of spatial configuration of habitat to metapopulation ecology. These observations on the impacts of habitat area, quality and aggregation all have practical implications on conservation action. The key conclusion here is that unless isolation of habitat patches is known to be the main constraint for a particular species and its persistence, more effort should be given to increasing total habitat amount and quality. How then do these three fundamental factors relate to species communities? The answer is not straightforward as requirements of different species vary. 
Equality is often defined in terms of freedom from human influence, but this so-called naturalness is tedious to measure for species communities in a sensible way, as some species benefit from human-induced disturbance, while others suffer from it. No universal causality is observed between habitat aggregation and species diversity. However, the effect of area on species richness is most strongly established. We know from empirical studies that species richness increases with the size of the examined area. The positive nonlinear relationship between increasing area and species richness has been detected both in studies focusing on a single habitat type and in studies that map entire landscape with several habitats. Let's draw the species area curve. It looks like this. The, the relationship can also be linearized using a logarithmic transformation. In general, area has a strong impact on the number of species or species richness. What if we scale up even further? The theory of island biogeography is among the most prominent ecological theories. It was formulated to explain the species area relationship. The theory builds on observations that species richness on islands tend to remain roughly constant over time, despite species turnover. That is, the community composition changes, but the overall number of species stays the same. To explain this, MacArthur and Wilson assumed that there is a dynamic equilibrium between new species coming to an island and old species dying out. In other words, immigration would bring new species to an island at the same rate as local extinction would remove species from that island. Let's see how this theory can be visualized. First, here we are relating the number of species present on an island with the rate of change in the number of species. The theory assumes that the extinction rate is higher when there are more species present. This results in a higher rate of change in species richness. At the same time, however, immigration brings new species to the island. Hypothetically, the immigration rate is higher on islands with less species present, as in these cases, it is more easy for species to become established on that island. Large islands are able to sustain more species with more individuals, and for that reason, it is assumed that extinction rates are lower than average on larger islands. Small islands then are assumed to have relatively higher extinction rates. The location of the island is important as well. Far away islands receive less immigration than average as they are distant from the sources of species. Here the main source of immigrating species is a continent and being far generally refers to an increasing distance between the island and a continent. And islands near a continent tend to receive more immigrating species. And here we have the assumed dynamic equilibrium that explains the roughly constant species richness on islands over time. There are now two main factors underlying the theory. Distance to the source pool of the species and size of the island or a habitat patch. These represent the dimensions of aggregation and area. According to island biogeography, aggregation and area interact in determining the species composition of a given location. The theory of island biogeography, however, does not take habitat quality into account. The theory of island biogeography has proven to be very difficult to validate, but it has received some empirical support anyway. Although developed within an island and sea context, the theory of island biogeography has since been generalized into terrestrial environments. 
in these applications, habitat patches represent the islands and the matrix in between the patches represents the sea. The research applications have included, for example, studies on whether it is better to conserve a single large protected area or several smaller ones. These studies have raised a lot of discussion on whether it is feasible to treat protected areas as islands and how to include species-specific traits such as endemism into the theoretical model. As a conclusion, the three fundamental factors of spatial ecology, that is area aggregation and quality, need to be taken into account in large-scale conservation planning as well. That was all for now. Thank you for listening.